Good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of House Calls, Real Docs, Real Talk. I'm Sonia Azad, and today we're discussing equal access to health care as it pertains to the LGBTQ community. Now, research is beginning to show some pretty troubling patterns, so we want to shed some light on this topic before it becomes an even bigger issue. Uh, If you've got a question, this is how we operate. Maybe you've never joined us before. You can go to heart.org backslash house calls and hit submit to drop it in the comments during the show. And we're going to do our very best to grab those and answer as many questions as we can. We always get such great questions. And really, you guys, your involvement is the key to our show. So before we go any further, stop what you're doing hit that share button, or maybe you want to start a watch party because we really want to let our friends and family know what we're doing here. Uh, And we want to get them involved too, of course. So throughout the show, we're also going to ask you to get involved by answering a few viewer questions. Now to respond, all you got to do is text AHA live to 22333. Now, we're not going to ask for your name or any information, nothing like that. It's just kind of a fun and easy way to answer. So if you don't want to text in, you can also participate by simply dropping your answer in the comment section. So let's get started. With me this morning is Dr. Billy Caceres, Assistant Professor at the School of Nursing and the Program for the Study of LGBT Health at Columbia University. So let's welcome in Dr. Caceres. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? Doing well, can't complain. Um, So before we begin, let's go ahead and get started with our first viewer response question. So to sort of set the stage for today, answer this statement. It's a true or false. LGBTQ adults report experiencing high rates of discrimination in healthcare settings. And uh, while you guys answer, and the question's there on the screen, Dr. Caceres, we started talking about this before we started the show. Um, I think when people think of health disparity, this doesn't pop out, or it's not the first thing to come to mind. Yeah, that's right. I think that, and we talked about this a little bit, but the first thing that comes to mind is uh, disparities based on race or ethnicity. And I think that in some ways, Um, Other types of disparities like LGBTQ health disparities aren't thought of as commonly as those. And part of it, I think, is because we don't we haven't done a really good job of helping people recognize the importance of social factors and really social factors are what drive these disparities that we see in LGBTQ populations. Is this like an emerging area of research? Well, I think that LGBTQ health research in general is not an emerging area of research. It's existed for decades now, but the focus now on thinking about things beyond HIV and mental health is really a newer area. So, but now what we're seeing is more and more people getting interested in doing research on cardiovascular health, cancer, and other physical health conditions in this population. Hmm, Good to know. Um, Okay. So, 100% of you who've weighed in are saying, A, even those folks who are weighing in uh, in the comments section, LGBTQ adults report experiencing high rates of discrimination in healthcare settings. Dr. Caceres, is that that correct? Is it true? (laughs) That is true, yes. So there is more and more research showing that LGBTQ adults not only experience discrimination in healthcare settings, but are also more likely to be afraid of potentially experiencing those types of discrimination by their healthcare providers, mm-hmm. which as you can imagine, has an impact on people's willingness to go in when they have a medical problem. And some people might delay care because of that reason. Yeah, something that uh, we hope to change as time goes on. Uh, okay, so thank you guys for weighing in and uh, let's move on and get started with our health in the headlines. Okay, so every week we select one current headline that ties back to the topic at hand, and then we ask our expert to respond. So this week's entry is from our very own newsroom at the American Heart Association. It reads, discrimination contributes to poorer heart health for LGBTQ adults. So Dr. Caceres, what are your thoughts here? 
Yeah, so I think that this is, it's really great that the American Heart Association sort of not only commissioned this statement on the cardiovascular health or heart health of LGBTQ people, but also has done a really great job of promoting this particular scientific statement and really highlighting discrimination as a cause of these health disparities that we see in this group. I had the pleasure of serving as the chair of this particular statement. So it's, it's this is and news to me, but I think what's important is really highlighting discrimination as a contributing factor to some of these health disparities, particularly around heart disease that we see in this population. Yeah, and I know you were heavily involved in sort of the, the writing of this, um, and, and it's not only appreciated, but celebrated, certainly. Uh, we want to get into our main segment now with live viewer questions. This is a fun segment always. You ask, we answer. So As a reminder, while we're talking today, you can submit your questions in the comments section uh, or you can submit them to heart.org backslash house calls. And I keep referencing this side over here because I got a laptop. I can see your comments and your questions as well. So let's get right to it. Our first question comes to us from Gloria in Kansas City. So Gloria is asking, why does a doctor need to know someone's sexual orientation or gender identity? This is a great question, Dr. Caceres. I agree, it's a really good question. And I think that in some situations, maybe a doctor or another health care provider doesn't need to know your sexual orientation or gender identity. But for many health outcomes, I think that it's becoming quite apparent that sexual orientation and gender identity might place some individuals at greater risk for certain health conditions. And in today's case, we're talking about heart disease. And I think the other important thing is that Assessing sexual orientation and gender identity as a commonplace practice in healthcare settings also helps normalize the process and actually helps increase visibility of LGBTQ people who in many ways might feel like they feel very fearful about actually coming out to their healthcare provider. This just sort of takes that fear away and I think helps providers have more um, more intimate conversations with their patients about the things that are really impacting their health. So our next question is from Edith in Canton, Ohio. This is another great question. How do patients find out if their doctor specifically is known for their efforts in treating LGBTQ patients with respect to uh, sort of cultural competence that they deserve before making an appointment? Yeah, and I think that that's a really good question. And I think it's one of the things that many LGBTQ people look for. So there are some resources, both locally and nationally. At the national level, you can uh, go to the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association website, which is glma.org. And they actually have a list of providers who have sort of been vetted and been placed on this list as people who have received um, training or provide LGBTQ inclusive care. But for many other providers, right, that list isn't exhaustive. It's not every single provider in the country. I think other ways are looking through your own networks among your LGBTQ friends and family members and finding um, providers that they've had good experiences with. That's another potential way of finding a provider. Uh, here's one question from Mike in Richmond. His question is, why is there so little research on this particular population and how do we encourage more projects and research that include LGBTQ people in the future? And this kind of speaks to what we were chatting about just a couple minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, so this is a sort of a two-pronged question, so I'll try to address both components. So there's so little research on this population, I think partially because these disparities are based on social factors, right? Things like discrimination and other forms of exclusion, like social policies and laws that don't protect LGBTQ people from discrimination or hate crimes are the primary drivers of these disparities. And I think that for, it's not until very recently, people haven't really recognized the role of social factors or what we call social determinants of health in influencing the health of marginalized or underrepresented populations like LGBTQ people. For the past 30 years or so, a lot of LGBTQ research has been around HIV and AIDS, which is an important topic. And I think that the research around HIV and AIDS has helped increase the visibility of other health topics and other health disparities among LGBTQ people, which has sort of opened up 
up the field a little bit more to look at other factors like substance use and mental health and heart health. I think one of the things that we need to do a better job of in terms of encouraging future research in this area is that these things for mental health and substance use and even HIV don't exist in isolation. And then in many ways, people that experience poor mental health, we know have higher risk for poor heart disease outcomes. And I think that sort of thinking about how these different outcomes are connected to one another is a good way of sort of moving forward research across these different areas, but specifically around heart health. Uh, Dr. Caceres, as you can imagine, there are a lot of great questions coming in. Uh, we've just really started, but we're going to take a break and uh, hit another poll question. So you guys who are watching, grab your phones, get ready to text in your answer. As a reminder, all you got to do is text AHA Live to 22333 to answer. Now, if you've already registered, you don't need to do it again. And if you're joining from your phone and want to make it easy, just drop your answer into the comments section. We've got them pulled up here as well. Okay, so our question is another true or false. It reads, LGBTQ adults are more likely to use tobacco than other adults. Do you think that is true or false? And um, while we're giving everyone a minute to respond to this, I'd like to tell you about an exciting event that's happening soon. October 29th, 2020 is One Cycle Nation. And uh, Cycle Nation is a community of cyclists, by the way, you guys. It really gets together to help fund life-saving stroke and heart research and promote brain and heart health. Normally, events like this are held across the country, but this year, of course, we know everything is virtual. Um, but there's a little silver lining here. The best thing about virtual events is that anyone can participate by logging miles and raising life-saving dollars, right? You don't have to be a cyclist. You can get those miles in any way you want. Maybe it's walking, maybe it's running. So we want to run a very short video to help you find out more. All right, that's a fun way to give back. It helps you, it helps others, it's a win-win. So wherever you are, please consider getting involved in One Cycle Nation. Okay, it looks like the polls are in. Ooh, this is gonna be an interesting uh, sort of topic <laughs> of conversation. LGBTQ adults are more likely to use tobacco than other adults. So it's 60-40 here, true, false. Dr. Caceres, what's the, what's the answer? Oh man, just went to 50-50. <laughs> Well, the answer is that this is true. So LGBTQ, not only adults, but also people across their lives, including adolescents, report um, using more tobacco products than non-LGBTQ people. And there's a number of reasons for this. There's some evidence that discrimination, which will, which is the main topic we're talking about today, does sort of drive higher use of tobacco products, including e-cigarettes and cigarettes and even cigars. The other aspect of it is, and what we see among LGBTQ youth, is that things like lower family support and greater family rejection are also associated with greater use of tobacco products like cigarettes and e-cigarettes. And I think that what that speaks to is the importance of these social factors in driving some of these disparities around tobacco use that we see in LGBTQ populations. I think the other aspect of it is too, is tobacco companies for a long time have actually created ads that targeted the LGBTQ community because they recognize the higher use of tobacco products. So we still see a lot of tobacco ads within gay bars and at LGBTQ events like pride events, which also further drive these increased rates of tobacco use in the population. You know, as a health reporter for many years, I have honestly never had these considerations until until just now. So do you think there are enough mental health resources or sort of alternatives, um, especially for these LGBTQ adol adolescents and youth that you're talking about to steer them in a different direction so that they don't go down this path? 
Well, I think it speaks to the importance of support, not only of support from peers, but also from family members. And I think that the more that we do to create more inclusive environments, not only in healthcare settings, but also in community settings like schools and healthcare clinics and even nursing homes, I think the more we'll be able to do to sort of help people engage in health promoting behaviors and engage less in sort of health damaging behaviors. And I think really the field around the impact of social support and how important that is, is really just sort of emerging within LGBTQ health. But I think that what we do see is that social support and having more of it is really helpful to people's health. And I think it helps people engage in behaviors that help promote their health rather than damage it. Yeah, humans are meant for connection. I always say yeah. that. Um, definitely. Okay, let's address a few more viewer questions here. We got so many good ones. Uh, here's one from Irma in Tennessee. What role does LGBTQ discrimination play over a lifetime in physical and mental health outcomes? I mean, we, we're sort of talking about that already. Yes, we are. And I think that the evidence on this in terms of research is much stronger for mental health outcomes and even substance use outcomes like tobacco use. So we know that among LGBTQ youth and adults that exposure to things like discrimination and other forms of rejection like family rejection are associated with worse um, mental health outcomes like higher rates of depression, anxiety, even suicidal ideation, particularly among those that are younger in the LGBTQ community. And we also have some emerging evidence that shows higher rates of tobacco use and alcohol use in relation to discrimination. What is less known is how discrimination impacts physical health outcomes like heart disease. And I think that one of the things that we've tried to do in the scientific statement that AHA just released is show that that's a really important area of research of, for understanding how does discrimination, quote unquote, get under the skin of LGBTQ people and other marginalized groups to influence physical health outcomes like heart disease? Uh, we've got another great question for you. Don from St. Louis wonders, how do patients find out if a particular hospital system is known for their efforts to treat LGBTQ patients with respect to cultural competence that they deserve, right? So this question mm -hmm. is asking about hospital systems, not individual doctors, which we talked about a little earlier. Yeah, and I think that that's an excellent question, right? Because sometimes it's harder to find out information about individual providers, but hospital systems or other healthcare institutions like nursing homes, you can actually look up this information at the Human Rights Campaign website at hrc.org. And under their resources tab, they actually publish an annual um, report called the Health Equality Index. And what this index does, it sort of creates, give, provides scores for different healthcare settings and institutions based on a number of different policies, including um, their involvement in LGBT in the LGBTQ community in their set in their areas. They also look at things like employment uh, policies towards actual people that work at those in those settings and whether or not they discriminate against LGBTQ people. And the last thing is whether or not they provide LGBTQ support services. So one thing that's sort of starting to occur more and more in major health systems is having specifically designated individuals in the healthcare system system that are LGBTQ liaisons or LGBTQ representatives that are specifically there to increase the knowledge of providers on LGBTQ health issues and also connect LGBTQ patients with appropriate services. Hmm. Uh, we've got one more for you from Elton in Nevada. And I love this question. As an ally, uh, Elton asks, how can I better support my LGBTQ friends and loved ones on their health care journey? And we just talked a lot about support, which we, sh we see research shows makes a difference. I think that this goes along with what we've been talking about and the importance of social connections and the importance of having a good social network. Um, and I think that it's, first of all, I'd like to commend anyone who's an ally that's thinking in this way, thinking about how do I support my LGBTQ friends and loved ones or family members. I think that there are many different ways of doing that. I think that the more that we can normalize the experiences that LGBTQ people have, I think that is a really important thing. As an ally, it's important to do more listening than talking and sort of do more learning from the experiences of other people that might be marginalized, like LGBTQ people. But I think that really just being there as a source of support for LGBTQ friends at any 
point in the life course or at any point in their um, coming out process, I think is particularly important, but it's especially important for those LGBTQ people who are at different ends of the life stages. So I, by that, I mean people that are younger individuals like LGBTQ adolescents and young adults and LGBTQ older adults, because we know that those particular periods of time are especially, um, social support is especially crucial during those particular periods of time. And more and more of the evidence that's coming out is really showing that having better social networks and really and and really good social support during those periods of time is really important. All right. Thank you guys so much for your great questions. Up next, we've got a new segment for you called Triple Trivia. <laughs> Triple Trivia, by the way, is sponsored by Crazy Cool Science, our new social media campaign that pumps up the fun in science. Now, science is everywhere, and Crazy Cool Science proves it. So today we've got three trivia questions lined up to test your scientific knowledge, and today's trivia focuses on stroke. So again, remember, you can drop your answers in the comments section, or you can text in with your answer, and we'll find out who's really on their game today, all right? So here's the first trivia question. What is the number one preventable cause of stroke? What is the number one preventable cause of stroke? Is it high blood pressure? Is it obesity? Or is it smoking. Now, when we talk about, as you guys weigh in, uh, Dr. Caceres, when we talk about preventable causes of stroke, a lot of people may not know that they can actually have a hand in preventing this type of event. Yes, and I think that that's what's really important here is that many people probably don't know that high blood pressure and obesity are preventable factors or are modifiable factors that individuals can potentially take steps to change or improve those risk factors to decrease their risk for stroke. So I think even just having these responses up there as preventable causes is important. And so is there one or is it kind of all of the above here? Is there, what's the number one preventable cause? Well, I don't think that I should give away the answer yet, but I think that, yes, there is, uh, we can identify the main preventable cause, but I think it's also important to think of this in a holistic manner and think of different risk factors and how we can sort of move the needle to decrease stroke risk along a number of risk factors, right? No, no one risk factor alone will absolutely reduce somebody's risk for this type of stroke. Yeah, that's important to note because everything is connected. <laughs> and when yeah. you're dealing with either high blood pressure, obesity, or smoking, you're involving several different systems of the body. And I think sometimes we forget that, you know. Um, okay, so we've got most people weighing in saying high blood pressure or obesity. Are they right? So the response to this question is high blood pressure as the number one preventable cause of stroke. And that's for a number of reasons, right? So people with high blood pressure can, inc can increase the stress on your arteries and your vascular system, which can cause um, a number of different sort of um, physiological changes that can increase somebody's risk for stroke, but particularly around blockages that can prevent blood flow from reaching the brain. So in the form of an ischemic stroke. And that is, yes, it's associated also with obesity and smoking and some other health factors, but high blood pressure is the number one risk factor. Okay, so those of you who answered A, good job. Uh, next question, which of the following are types of stroke? You just mentioned one of them. <laughs> oh, I gave it away. You, you gave it away. No, not uh, not entirely though. We'll see who was really listening closely. Uh, we've got ischemic, hemorrhagic, warning stroke, or all of the above. Oh, so, so we've got an all of the above. So uh, we've got a little bit of time to let people weigh in. So you've got A, B, C, or D. Um, Dr. Caceres, without giving things away, <laughs> what can you tell us about these options? Hmm, I'm trying to think of ways of not giving this <laughs> away. I think that what's important I, overall is to think about how can we lead healthier lives and reduce our risk factors for stroke and other forms of cardiovascular disease. I think that's sort of the most important um, consideration. And then I also think it's really important to educate ourselves about signs of things like stroke and heart attack and other forms of cardiovascular disease so that we're really on the ball in terms of thinking about our health and potential factors that influence our cardiovascular health. 
You are so good. That was, you should be a lawyer and a doctor. That was a really good response <laughs> without giving it away. Um, but I guess, you know, in all seriousness, we should say that when we think of stroke or talk about stroke, more often than not, people don't associate it with different types. I mean, I don't know how many people really know that there are different types of stroke. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, I, for the most part, I don't think I'm giving much away. Now we see the audience is sort of weighed in and about 60% believe that all of the above is the correct answer. And that 60% is correct, that there are a, num a different uh, number of different types of strokes. But the important thing I think is that many of the risk factors for one type are also risk factors for the other type. So that was my point of really thinking about how can we reduce our risk overall versus thinking about any one risk factor. But if we were thinking about one risk factor, we now know that it's hypertension. I think the other important thing, and it goes to the point that I sort of discussed briefly earlier, is it's important to know the signs of stroke because regardless of the type of stroke, they have very similar signs. And for us to understand the signs of stroke and do something early on once we develop signs and symptoms is really important. So I think an important acronym that we talk about a lot is the FAST acronym, where F is for face drooping, a is for arm weakness, S for slurred speech, and T is for time. And that really means that the number one first thing to do if you're having any symptoms of stroke is to call 911 because time is so important in terms of treating strokes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys remember that FAST acronym. Uh, I know for sure I've done several stories with people who remembered that notice the signs and we're able to help to save someone's life. Uh, so our final question here, our poll question, uh, what percent of strokes that happen are due to preventable causes? What percent of strokes that happen are due to preventable causes? So while we're allowing people to answer, are there strokes that happen due to causes you can't prevent? And what does that look like? Yes, I think certainly there are strokes that can happen um, from traumatic brain injuries, for example. There could be hemorrhagic strokes in relation to that. If somebody has had a really traumatic sort of blunt force trauma, like in a car accident or some other form of trauma. But I think what's important about this and sort of what we're talking about today in general is that a lot of these things are sort of preventable and that they're uh, that there are certain genetic factors that potentially increase your risk for stroke or for things like hypertension, but that overall, I think it's important not to just think about your own family history, which is certainly important, but also about preventable steps we can take to reduce our risk for something like a stroke. Yeah, knowing your family history, and I know that we've got quite an international audience, it's sometimes hard to know your family history without going digging, especially if you've mm -hmm. got family kind of in all corners of the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that I, for I, one of the important things I think that has come out of having more research on genetics is understanding really the role of family history in driving some of these cardiovascular diseases that we see. And really, what we know is that for most cardiovascular diseases, it's no one gene alone that can inc that can just have somebody have a heart attack or a stroke. That it's really a combination of different factors, right? Certainly. Okay, our our audience is weighing in sixty percent is uh, the top answer here. What is what is the correct answer? So the correct answer is actually 80%. So wow. only about 20% of strokes are caused by things you cannot change, like your family history, a birth defect, or a clotting disorder. But up to 80% of strokes can be prevented by doing a number of things, decreasing smoking, making healthy food choices, getting enough physical activity, maintaining a healthy weight, and of course, treating conditions like high blood sugar, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. Well, we certainly learned a lot. Dr. Caceres, thank you so much for guiding us through today's topic. Uh, while some of us may be uh, you know, aware of the challenges of the LGBTQ community on their healthcare journeys, not everyone's aware, right? And so we wanna just underscore and highlight that conversations like this one today aren't only gonna help someone who needs the advice, but help to educate people as well. So uh, Dr. Caceres, do you have any final thoughts? I mean, I think the final thought that I want to leave the audience with is to really think about 
not only supporting LGBTQ people in your everyday lives, but also thinking about being involved in advocacy and in different initiatives that actually support the health of LGBTQ people. I think it's really important to think about LGBTQ disparities don't just occur because of interpersonal or like within or between person forms of discrimination. There's also social policies that drive some of these disparities. And it's important as allies and as members of the LGBTQ community to think about those things and have those in our consciousness. Thank you so much. I couldn't have said it better myself. Dr. Caceres, uh, what a pleasure to have uh, that knowledge and wisdom today as we step away from this. And always, we're going to round out our show with a fun health hack for you. And this week, Health Hacks is brought to you by the American Heart Association's Scientific Session. So Scientific Sessions is happening November 13th through 17th. Registration is open right now, and this year it's all virtual. So anyone from anywhere can attend. And the conference spans basic clinical and population science in cardiovascular and resuscitation research. It also offers tons of opportunity for networking. So please go take a look at the event page and register today. Hey, check out this video. All right, and this week's health hack comes to us from Linda. She's got a few fitness suggestions to help you stay active. I love that. Number one, grab a basket, so not a cart, but a basket the next time you grocery shop to work out your arm muscles. Hey, that's a good idea. And then number two, eat an orange before you work out. Not only does it keep you hydrated, Linda says it helps to prevent sore muscles. Hey, I did not know that. I'm going to have to check that out. Thank you, Linda. I didn't know that an orange away keeps an orange a day keeps the soreness away, right? Um, okay. So remember we feature a new tip every week. So if you've got a great idea, a little health hack, you can send it to us at heart.org backslash house calls. And hey, you might see your idea live right here on the show. That does it for us today. Remember, you can find any of our previous shows at heart.org backslash house calls. And don't forget, since there are always more great questions than we have time to answer, you'll find the answers to everything we didn't get to on our house calls after show. So you can find that Thursday on the American Heart Association's YouTube channel. Thanks so much for tuning in with me this morning. I'm Sonia Azad, and we'll reconnect right here again next Monday. Learn more about house calls, real docs, real talk, and submit your questions at heart.org slash.